Yeah, I'm glad. There we go. Woo! I'm glad we're recording now. There's certainly nothing ridiculous was happening five seconds before now. That would be very embarrassing. No, not at all. Not, not at all. Zero percent chance of that. Zero. Less than zero. Um, like how people can try like 110%. There was there was a negative 10% chance that anything was happening that was embarrassing that Derek was saying. Nothing. Yeah. That's how odds work. I've been to a casino. Yep. Like once, twice. Always bet on Matt. Nice. And roulette, always bet on Matt. It's not a yeah. color, sir. I said. <laughs> I'm like, hey, what's that? He looks over there and I start scr- scr- scribbling my name on the actual wheel. Matt. And you're like, sir, and you're just throwing chips on the table, which I'm now going to take. So yeah. you can't do that, sir. That's why, that's why you always bet on Matt. I'm like, I think you Matt. misheard. No, no, no. I'm inflatable. I never make mistakes. Yeah. And I'm like, don't you know Matt always wins? And they're like, no, the house always wins. No, yeah, no, house- I am the house. This is Matt's house. And like, no, it's clearly Caesar's palace. Yeah, there's that's what I said. There's <laughs> a lot of security there for a reason for people like us and many other much more legitimate threats. Uh, we're just a threat to their sanity. We're, we're not. <laughs> We're not a yeah. threat to their money. Yeah, they're just like, what? <laughs> what? Just take them outside and hurt them, yeah. per usual, and don't listen to them. And you're like, that's exactly what we wanted. You fell uh, right into our trap. Check and mate <laughs> casino thugs. <laughs> so, Derek. Matt. It is, it's lovely out here today. Is it lovely? It's though? terrible here. It's actually cold really? and raining all day. Oh, that sucks. That's going to be nice tomorrow. Okay, gonna nice. go in early got some business to do it's nice cool. to have business yeah nice mm-hmm. um well today well, we're gonna talk about something i think important although i don't know how important um it's considered anymore uh but if you recall derek uh i want to talk about the importance of critical thinking uh and what it is and uh I know that's something we all say, or maybe not we all, but growing up there, it was a very common thing to say, you know, we should improve our critical thinking or, you know, it's really good to have high quality critical thinking skills. And uh, I went to a, I went to a private school that emphasized science and critical thinking. Um, well, I mean, and, and, you know, that we used to know what those things meant, um, right. but instead science uh, has not been replaced with the science. And critical thinking is definitely a sign of white hegemony. Uh, it is, it is. Unless, unless you've co-opted the word critical thinking um, from a critical theory point theory of view. Persp- yeah. Um, and now you've just converted it because doublespeak is part of how critical theory works. Um, yeah. Not how critical thinking works. No. Um, and so those words don't, uh, they don't, they don't mean any more necessarily what they used to mean, but that's okay. Um, because today we're going to talk about what we think is, I think, the more authentic critical thinking, uh, the mm-hmm. more classical one that uh, is usually referenced. And uh, I think sometimes people lose track of why that's important and what that even means. How do you do that? What occurs in the absence of critical thinking? Well, so what do you think there, Derek? Uh, suboptimal decisions based on other things, based on not critical thinking, like um, appeals to emotion. Okay, so... Or- I agree with you. fallacies. Or... Well, I, I agree with you, but let's maybe let's just clarify what critical thinking is then. Okay. okay. So, so what, how would you call it? What, like, if you were going to describe it to somebody and say, well, critical thinking, you know, you could take for granted that the person that's listening to you knows what that means. Uh, and right. I, I probably would as well. Right. And that, but if, if they didn't, I'd say, it's not my job to educate you. <laughs> that what you would just, say. I would just stare at them scornfully and then walk away. Yeah, because that's totally the kind of thing you would do. Yeah, I know. That's how I, that's how I like to engage with others, with scorn uh, and contempt and sometimes laughter. Well, I, and it's true. Um, well, you probably don't torment your colleagues in the same way that I do, probably in a different uh, way. No, I don't have the... Yes, I have my own I, I, yeah. <laughs> Um And uh, I tormented a couple of them today, and I'm not going to talk about what their answers were, but I asked them, I said, hey, you know, just for interest's sake, uh, Derek and I are recording a podcast today. Would you, you know, do me a favor, okay? Um, you know, entertain me for a second and say, hey, how would you describe or how would you define critical thinking? They know it's okay? never just a second, right? Um, well, 
the whole conversation know it never for a second, and they do know that. Uh, yeah. but, but the fact that I would be trying to ask them to describe something that seems obvious um, was just for a brief period of time so that we could establish what that was so I could ask them whether or not they think it's important. Uh, and I actually got really two really interesting answers from my colleagues, okay. today, um, which is, is very cool. But I, I wanted to at least you know ask you that question just for clarity's sake and listening. Well, how would you describe critical thinking if we're all on the same page here? Uh, critical thinking is roughly using some modified form of the scientific method in order uh, various uh, dilemmas in order to arrive at some fact-based uh, optimal solution to problems or mm. approaches to situations. Okay, and do you think that that's something that happens naturally in people's minds or does that take a deliberate effort to do that? It usually takes a deliberate effort because very often people will typically have like an impulse decision or an impulse feeling about how to do something mm -hmm. and critical thinking sometimes. Um, and th those, those impulses can very well be correct, but mm -hmm. critical thinking very often involves an extra step or assessment, which for somebody who is um, on the more impulsive side, the way I am after being hit in the head a few too many times, um, no, I was like this before addict, but um, takes a, uh, some degree of mindfulness in the traditional sense of tapping the brakes. Like I, I, I know you feel like you need to do it this way, but step back and see if there's possibly a better way to approach or solve something. Okay. So do you think it would be fair to say that if critical thinking often um, for most people, or at least sometimes for everybody uh, takes a deliberate attempt uh, to engage in, that it's not something that we do intuitively. Yeah, I would say it's a skill rather than an innate process. Mm. But a lot of things that we do without thinking at this point in their lives are skills, like driving, where you just don't need to think about driving. You just kind of, your body just does and gets in the car and it goes um, without deliberately thinking about uh, pressing the gas, pressing the brake, or turning the wheel in a particular direction, or monitoring your speed or whatever. All these things... Um, we're very good at autom automating things. Mm -hmm. uh, so critical thinking in some ways can be automatic, but like any other skill, it doesn't always start out that way. It does, but I, I would say that actually, and I like your analogy with driving, um, that in the same vein, even if it's something that becomes somewhat automatic, uh, at the point it becomes automatic, we actually start to lose some of the crispness of its precision or proficiency. Yes. Um, because people's actual quality of their attention to the details associated with all the elements of driving. And driving is actually a very complex thing that's, that's happening, is. right? Um, over time, when we become acclimated to it, um, our complacency sets in and actually people on, on average after a period of time aren't the greatest drivers. They're no, you become, most... you, get, you become more so over time because of that yeah. degrading quality of attention and suddenly deciding that this is a great time to text. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that I think that critical thinking can be the same thing. It might be something that we generally tend to get good at, but then even if over time we regularly engage in that uh, type of thinking, it, we still need to often refresh uh, our own understanding or perception of the degree to which we're actually doing it effectively because we're likely to become complacent um, as a result. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I mean, I think that's I think that's reasonable, right? An, an attempt at, a, at implementing some sort of scientific approach. Well, pl well, plus, I mean, um, the critical thinking is bounded based on what you just said is bounded by your own understanding of things. Mm -hmm. So that's why Absolutely. it's always nice to have people to not be the smartest person in the room or the most knowledgeable person in a situation because there will always or very often be something that could be more helpful or more um, effective approach to whatever situation you're evaluating. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, if, if, if you're someone that is willing to accept the uh, criticism, right, um, hopefully constructive, but not necessarily, um, and it need not be if, if you care about improving at all, um, if you're good at receiving the criticism of, of others, just being in the presence of other people uh, over time will increase the resolution, the quality of your decision making. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is something that I know it's going to blow some people's minds. It's like, what do you mean? I've already decided what I know is right and what's yeah, wrong. Yeah, exactly. I just... I, I'm a finished product here at yeah, 22 what... years old. Yeah. I, I've, I've peaked. I've capped out at my it's true. It's true. mental facilities, which in terms of processing speed, you might have. But I mean, there's a lot more than being quick. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, right. 
Yeah, or absolutely. Right, or most right, if or. Well, you wouldn't even know what that looks like, in my opinion. Right. That's, um, that's also true. I mean, these are very and and again, I I know that you know none. I mean, Derek to a certain extent, but I especially like to harp on young people um, and their egotistical approaches because I was very egotistical in my approaches in my early 20s. I was, I was insufferable. Yeah. I don't harp on them so much because it's a developmental phase. Uh, it so, is. It is. I agree with you. But it's like harp, harping on toddlers for weak object permanence. It's like, well, it's kind of not losers, loser baby falling for peekaboo. Okay. Idiot. So, I was yeah. here all the time. It's a much more sophisticated version of that when it comes to that weak theory of mind where i've been i'm being exposed i'm de- i'm coalescing into a person that subscribes to certain principles ideas or ideologies for the first time and w- w- as that cooling process happens throughout your 20s uh you tend to get a lot softer but when it's new when you've just sort of like crammed all of those things into what is mostly a co-opted identity at that point, then yes, you're going to suddenly feel very strongly about the things that you didn't know until yesterday. And that is a very common approach of people in their early twenties. Um, and I tend to have a lot more patience with that just because again, it's a de- developmental thing. Um, but that kind of makes me sanctimonious in a way, in my own way being like, Oh, you'll know better than you're older when you're older idiot. Um, <laughs> Well, well, so if all things were equal, then I would treat that developmental stage as equally as to be expected and worthy of consideration and temperance as the one that you're talking about with object permanence, right? With babies. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we are currently living in an era where that is not the case. Uh, And in fact, the presumptuousness and egotistical certainty that uh, consumes the minds of people in their early 20s because they disproportionately are vocal, especially because of the advent of the internet, have somehow leveraged, have leveraged their ego and their own fragility um, against the world. And they are demanding that we all somehow, whether it is voluntarily or coercively, uh, decide to adopt a way of managing the world according to their tenets. And so as a result, it is my opinion that they need to be knocked down a couple of fucking pegs. And Mm. I say that, and I say that to myself. They'll get up again. Well, and I say that to myself, right? If people like me, when I was in my early twenties had the internet where it is today. Oh, I would be awful. I would need to be knocked down a fucking peg. I would be be pretty insufferable. I I mean, I'm insufferable now. Try to imagine me uh, at about 20. Totally. Yeah. So like, I don't, I don't harp on young people because I think that they are especially deserving to be the recipients of criticism, but we've actually entered into a state, at least in the Western world, where we have given them such a voice and for some reason, which has yet to be explained to me, an amount of credibility by virtue of the fact that they have a voice that they seem to govern or guide almost the totality of all social discourse in the Western world. And, and actually, I'm, I just don't know why we even permit that. I really, they should be permitted to say it, but they're not guiding principles. Would you right. let, would you let anyone in their early choice guide the social conversation? Like, are you joking? You can me? think about that objectively in an institution far from you. But when you think about your own situation or your own job, you think, Oh God. Mm-hmm. Oh no. I, I just keep thinking back to Ace of Base and that throwaway line that I love so well from 1991, that life is demanding without understanding. And somehow we've lost that mm-hmm. between 1991 and the internet. Well, because uh, music that would have even compelling throwaway lines doesn't exist anymore. That's, or at least at least it's not um, modern. projected or, or uh, vol- given the same um, standard or popularity behind the industry as previous was previously yeah was. and a song about self-reflection even re- the relatively superficial self-reflection mm-hmm. in the sign um is no longer existent which is a sad mm-hmm. thing that i hadn't really thought about until just now and mm-hmm. again you've ruined that for me too i don't even know what categorically was just ruined but i do know that you can put a mark on the side of your skull or in your bedpost or wherever you mark your uh string of ruinations mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, because uh, I am the destroyer of worlds, Derek. 
No, you're just a destroyer you know? of funds of, it, of, of the things that anyone could enjoy ever. So in that way, you're very much like a feminist, actually. But okay. instead, of, instead of just pointing out how everything's racist and sexist and homophobic all the time, everywhere to everyone, you just mm. you just undermine what people like about things. But you um, do have a much more eclectic and diverse tool set. So I, I give you credit for that. I also don't intentionally set out to do that. It just seems to occur. You just explain the, the, the bald faced truth. Yeah. To me and I'm, like, and, oh, and I'm just, I'm just, you know what, in that regard, maybe I'm just a free roaming feminist, right? I don't follow an ideology. I just kind of wander around, bump into people and inadvertently ruin things. Well, I mean, to be fair, the, <laughs> rife, the world, I, the life, I the the world and the life got smashed together. The, 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 the world would be better if more feminists were like you. Although many of them do have your facial hair now, which is great. Hmm. Um, Sick, bruh. Bruh, but bruh. Um, but bruh, critical thinking, bruh. Yeah, so critical thinking. So I think that that's a relatively, in, uh, relatively straightforward, benign description of it. I don't think there's anything controversial about that. You know, an attempt to apply some sort of scientific approach or, or methodology to your perceptions or conceptualizations in an attempt to hopefully come up with something of higher resolution um, than you would have in the absence of it. Mm -hmm. Again, assuming that our own intuitions and natural instinctive decision-making doesn't always produce the best outcome, even for our own interests, but maybe could certainly be could be improved upon. It could be, but, but, it, but I mean, when we start starting to consider things that are much more broader and large scale than just ourselves, well, then you probably need a much more high resolution lens to look at something. Because um, mm -hmm. we're just not wired to, to think of things like that by default. We have to work at it. Um, okay, so critical thinking. Derek, is it important? Do you think it's important for people or valuable for people and why? Well, I mean... I think Peter Boghossian has um, a similar lecture about ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. Like when he, when he, he does. Yeah. Um, basically like if he wants to measure, if he needs a new door and he wants to measure his doorway, one of the ways he can go about trying to get that is by asking his dog, which is a, one way to go about knowing something. It's not sure. a very good way. And then he talks about praying to find out. And then he talks about measuring to find out. So, I mean, there's, Due to the plurality and nature of people um, and the plurality and diversity and nature of various circumstances, there are going to be a lot of divergent ways to solve a lot of different problems. But mm -hmm. critical thinking would be effective, I could see, to prune, like to immediately prune back a lot of the uh, useless or completely ineffectual options when dealing with a novel situation or optimizing problem solvings for more familiar situations mm. through iteration. Okay, I, I think that's a true. Am, am, am I just talking around it and not really giving you a good de definition? Uh, no, I think that you're, I think that you answered it well, but I think that um, what could have been stated more explicitly for anyone who doesn't know you that well would be that doing that with your decision-making, right? Kind of like the immediacy of the pruning that occurs during that implementation of it, is mm -hmm. valuable because you have a, a likely a goal in mind mm -hmm. that you would like to achieve and that will assist you to achieve that goal. Yes. Right. Um, okay. So what if though someone does that type of thinking, they start to engage some sort of approach where they try to examine maybe more things, compare them, and they figure out that during that I guess, maybe session of critical thinking that the decision that they end up reaching is not the one they initially wanted. And they actually prefer the other one because the other one maybe benefits them more and it's easier. Okay. At well, that point, well, I mean, are they going to be encouraged to reach a conclusion based on critical thinking then? Well, that, then it's not, then it, you're into a moral dilemma territory rather than critical thinking because you can, um, Um, do I do I not quite understand what you're what you're what are you drinking by the way that looks very colorful uh this is a um coconut lemongrass Thai or Thai they call it a Thai PA but I don't want to call it that 
So oh, like a, a Thailand style um, pale ale. I, I, I was looking at it. I was like, and I was thinking, I got to start drinking again. And then you called it a mm. Thai PA, and then I was like, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm I out. didn't call it that. They called it that. I just. I, I, I know. I know. I was marketed it that way. I'm like, fine, sober <laughs> forever. Um, well, I mean, what I, what I was getting at is, you know, when someone adopts a approach um, or rather a critical thinking approach, it's very likely that what they were hoping to pursue was truth or some mm-hmm. better approximation of what might be a clearer or more obvious or evident or truthful conclusion. But actually, that one seems to just generate more work for you. And it actually ends up defeating what your inclination was, which was to do something birthed out of self-interest. And so now we're going to have a um, desire to avoid critical thinking, because in my opinion, well, in my opinion, I think that to voluntarily engage in critical thinking and then utilize the conclusions that are reached that you have have occurred, what's going to happen is that has to, that in and of itself demonstrates some amount of empathy, right? For other people. It does. It does. And that, well, uh, and that's what I thought you were going after. There's mm-hmm. doing what is right and doing what is easy. Mm-hmm. And doing what is easy is very rarely the most um, optimal, especially if you're, you're doing, if you have a goal in mind, goals are typically things worth striving for, not things you can typically pick off the ground as mm-hmm. you go through your daily life. Um, and so you can generate a plan and then think, ah, eh, that's hard. But, but the thing is, though, once you know something, it's very difficult to unknow it. It is. And in fact, you could be criticized at some point if you did know what the right thing was. Abstaining from doing it might make you a bad person. Might make, it might, it might it make might. you a bad It, it might, might. Make you a bad person. And even if nobody ever calls you on it while you're doing the thing suboptimally or wrong or selfishly, part of you might be uh, nagging somewhere in the back of your consciousness that you know better. Yeah, you do know better. You do know better. And the mere fact that you have some sort of conscious saying that to you is an indication that there is something truthful that exists, right? Like there, at least you believe there to be something truthful that exists, right? So um, the mere fact that you would even accept critical thinking as as a legitimate approach infers that you think there is some conclusion that can be reached that's approximating more more towards truth than otherwise. Yeah, and there's that aspirational quality of it. And I mean, I believe in very... uh, accessible aspirationalism Mm -hmm. you know just being because we think aspirational and some nearly divine quest or whatever but it's really just being a little bit better as a as a parent as a husband um as an employee as an employer than you were the day before because if you're like me at all um there'll be moments when you're going to bed when you think of things that happened in the day and maybe some of them that could have been gone gone a bit differently or things that at least in terms of my part in them, how I could have reacted or performed better. Mm -hmm. And that's a time when I find myself doing, doing this sort of thinking and assessment. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's never, I'm always right all the time. And those other people are just assholes because that is worthless. When in fact I am dealing occasionally with some very uh, angry people. For difficult people, yeah. Difficult people working with customer service, high end stuff, but there there are a lot of ways to see that coming and get ahead of that, and to uh, ingratiate myself with people in a in a customer service, not necessarily in a selfish way, but in a high end service sort of way, that can cause me to have a better outcome maybe than the one I got. And it's not like I, it's not like I run a bad business and there's a lot of catastrophic outcomes that I constantly need to go to bed triaged. Like, why did these people throw things at my truck again? <laughs> but just like just little things, because if you're doing or whatever it is in your career, um, interacting things with people, maintaining mechanical things optimally, um, yeah. there's just so much there. And even if you spent a lot of time doing it throughout your lifetime, the way I have, there are always new things that come up. Um, as in any customer service job, you think you, you think you've seen everything, and then you just go in one more day, and oh, oh, this is happening now. Mm. Oh, good. Huh. That's weird. Oh, yeah. How how how, exci- how exciting. Mm-hmm. This has never happened before, and every time you think you're done saying that, um, the universe will provide. But um, so that that's really the functional um, 
way of going about this. And sometimes it involves uh, workshopping things with my wife and it's always help, helping, um, helpful to do uh, some of my best thinking, not alone, um, within my own head, um, because she will point out, because she has a different skill set and she's much better with people than I am because I hate all of them. Mm. And um, she only hates most of them. Mm. And so um, she can help me devise better strategies for better outcomes in whatever situations arise involving people. Yeah, I, I mean, something that you pointed out and it only occurred to me to, to draw this connection. I saw you right, take a note. I was like, got him. Right when you say this um, was that in it, it appears as if the mere, the mere activity of introspection or mm-hmm. self-reflection is a critical thinking process. It is. And yeah. a lot of people don't think of it this way because you're like, I'm not out there solving equations that sure. need to be like very few people have that in their real life. So it's not something as dry and academic sounding as critical thinking can be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But that, that, that way of, of, of looking at it never occurred to me till right now. Well, really? Because that yeah. is how I typically think of the way that most people can engage with it. Like, how do I have, and it's almost a buzzword now, but just a like a, a, a strengths-based growth mindset, mm-hmm. which was, is what you might call the same thing in, psych, in psychology, which is not a real science. So please call it critical thinking. Um, but just, just being able to reflect and thinking like, how can I make improvements, however incremental and small in these sorts of situations that I often encounter in, in my job or whatever. And that small. doesn't mean that they're going to happen, but merely uh, appraising them and trying to improve your orientation or approach to them is in itself a valuable exercise mm. to becoming not necessarily a better at what you do, even if you don't like your job, it just makes you better at engaging with people and navigating situations in the world, which is very important and beneficial to pretty mm. much anybody. Even yeah, if you're a sure. psychopath, you're just doing it for evil. <laughs> How could I be better at instrumentalizing people? Did I go about well, that the right way? They, they do think like that. I yeah, mean, clearly, absolutely they, they do. Clearly they, clearly they do. They're just, they're just missing uh, any, regu- any internal regular, mm-hmm. regulatory process on those thoughts. And mm-hmm. that's why they're so, ch- one of the reasons why they're so interesting to the rest of us and terrifying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, one, one day we should have a conversation about what to do about the problem of psychopaths. Death penalty. See, that's a tough one, though. Um, I, I mean, I've worked impatient with them, and which is, granted, a very limited slice of the population. Yes. But you just see these people that are going to leave uh, destruction. Not necessarily death, but uh, destruction. Um, in human collateral, um, wherever they go, and it that's is just what they're going to do. They're like be- they're like beavers. Where if you put beavers on top of the Empire State Building, they would try to build a dam up there. Well, these people are the same way, just in terms of um, instrument. Did you what, what term did you use? Instrumentalizing or yeah. instrumentalizing people, and th- that's just how they get their needs met. Mm-hmm. Um, like your fruit off a tree to be eaten and your rind discarded. Um, And so um, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's why I- mean, true, true, but I- That made me a believer in the death penalty. However, then you need the state to carry that out and they're gonna fuck it up, Um, so. Well, I mean, many people in the state in high power positions may be psychopaths. Um, Well, they don't want the competition, so they're gonna move that along. Not true. Um, So, Again, that's not the, the purpose of the conversation today, but that is an interesting episode we could have because I have some thoughts about the evolutionary value of a certain percentage of the population being psychopaths. Well, um, it's it's steady at about two, one to two. Yeah. Um, so I, I, there, there's certainly something there. I, I probably wouldn't go to the extent uh, to say, well, that's why we have the death penalty, but um, I, can, I can understand completely why someone would say that. Um, it makes it makes sense. I don't know if I would go that far, but but for sure, I had a question I wanted to ask you about this um, because I had just finished um, doing some reading um, mm-hmm. from excerpts by uh, books 
or rather from books by uh, Greg Lukianov. And okay, I um, the lawyer, right? Uh, you know what? I don't know if he is a lawyer, but he's the he head is, of the. He, is he? Fire the. Yeah, he's the, the head of the fire. Yeah, freedom guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's a lawyer. Um, okay, and um, among he, many other things. Yeah, he he has a couple books I was actually trying to get a hold of, and and they're actually difficult to get a hold of, which was kind of strange to me. Um, but uh, he had likened um the certain types of promoted thinking on college campuses uh which he does cover uh to some extent with jonathan height in the coddling of the american mind um and he and he likened them to things that you are encouraged to avoid doing uh during cognitive behavioral therapy that, that he yes. has undergone yep. and it, it made me think yeah, he of, was very de- uh greg lukianov was very depressed he struggled with depression and among other interventions that he tried cognitive b- behavioral therapy which is a way to break up maladaptive thinking strategies and in a way kind of shoehorn some degree of results-based critical thinking into it that would be my short spiel <clears throat> on that yeah, and, and actually that, that was what I wanted to ask you um, because it, it seems to me, and, and I'm familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy, I know how it works and I know when it's usually attempted. Uh, and I know actually that, uh, or maybe I wouldn't say no, but from what I've read, uh, it, seemed, it, it actually has a very good amount of uh, progress and positive uh, outcomes associated with as it. It's very effective. As, as far as I know, and my knowledge is about three or four years old at this point, but cognitive behavioral therapy has some of the best evidence-based results in terms of therapeutic interventions, which is not to mm-hmm. say that other people that due to the diverse people seeking diverse uh, psychiatric assistance for a for broad range of challenges can't find, I mean, no therapist, let me just put it to you this way. No therapist is just a cognitive behavioral therapists, if you ask what their approach is, it's always eclectic and cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the things that many people use because sometimes people just need to really nail down the narration of their life. But among Mm -hmm. all the tools that people might think of when they think therapy, um, not counting medication, cognitive behavioral therapy in terms of talk therapy interventions has the best record Mm -hmm. in terms of uh, evidence-based results because a lot of what it is is interrupting the sort of negative... um, thought processes that crop up around the effective states and affective, like emotional states Mm -hmm. of uh, mental illness and cramming cramming the wedge of rational thinking in there as best as you can in the moment. And then you can think your way. And even if you don't feel better, it can give you the option to make a better choice, like just not to like go out with your friends instead of staying home and being miserable. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's a, a lot of things like that um maybe you can maybe you can uh, un- <laughs> put up an anonymous window and we could have my wife come up here and talk a lot more about it because she <laughs> she has done podcasts and spoken about that and she's a extremely competent practitioner of many different skill sets of a cognitive behavioral therapy is something that she uses with a lot of people and if people don't go for the cognitive behavioral therapy they they're probably not going to stick um mm. like did you do your homework and then you're complaining again and it's like oh Oh, honey, you might, <laughs> you might want somebody that, that just listens to your bullshit. So th- there's a challenge in it. But then again, for people that have the that are willing to set an aspirational goal, just being like, I want to get better at managing my mental illness because this hurts. Mm-hmm. Instead of curling up and waiting to die, maybe I can try to make things a little bit better for myself tomorrow mm-hmm. than they were today, even if that is just less intolerable, but still intolerable. Um it's something that you can, it's one of the many things people can grasp hold of. And it's pretty accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so I have two questions then. I'm sorry, that was probably a lot more. I know no, you I'm... hate it when I apologize to you, but I just know that you're Canadian and so you feel more comfortable when there's more apologies in a conversation. So that's part of why I do it. No, that, that's good. And I appreciate you trying to make me as comfortable as possible. Yep. Um, <laughs> my, I have two questions. Um, you did actually offer a great deal of explanation that was probably answering a question I was going to ask anyways. So it's my job to know what you're thinking. It is. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's terrible. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> no, that's uh, 
Well, do you want to know what I'm thinking? Anyway. No, I don't. <laughs> and uh, so my two questions are, would, was my um, kind of very general comparison in my mind uh, between cognitive behavioral therapy being effective and the fact that it's very similar to critical thinking, is that a fair comparison or assumption? That's, I would say that's a very fair comparison mm -hmm. um, because there are... I know it's overly simplistic, but... It's overly simplistic. And yeah. again, it's very individual and situation specific, but what it's doing there is it's trying to give you not necessarily an optimal way to approach problems, but just to generate anything better than what uh, sitting in your disease or sitting in your sickness is going to encourage you to do automatically, which is tip almost always maladaptive because otherwise it wouldn't be a disease. Um, so my second question then is if critical thinking is similar, at least in some ways to a cognitive behavioral therapeutic approach, and there are a lot of people, um, especially young people, right? I don't know if if any if everyone listening is familiar, but um, in 2018, that was the last time I had got that data. Uh, within the last 10 years prior to that, so between 2008 and 2018, yeah. uh, the uh, incidence of diagnoses of depression and anxiety among boys and girls, right? So um, men and women under the, or I guess not men and women, but males and females or boys and girls under the age of 18, yeah, uh, had tripled mm -hmm. um, compared to the previous uh, ten years, and so well, I I think that's because they're all trans and they're just not <laughs> getting enough puberty blockers. Uh, I mean, that would have said anybody, right? Um, yeah. But the 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 thing the reason why I bring that up is let's say we have a unprecedented uh, generational concern associated with the adoption of maladaptive thinking, right? Mm -hmm that could benefit from something like cognitive behavioral therapy. Instead, they're probably being medicated, which is probably not good for them either. Um, they are discouraged from doing things simultaneously like critical thinking mm -hmm. um, because they are told to trust their feelings and their emotions. Would well, you say, that... would you say, so my question is, would that be terrible advice to give to a young person? Yes. And why would that be terrible advice? Well, because young people, they haven't done a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Because just by merit of being young, mm -hmm. not because they're lazy or unmotivated, but like sure. you're, you, you're just at the beginning of your life and people and things that are novel or uncertain or that you haven't done before are scary, right? Mm -hmm. And nobody waits till they're no longer afraid to do the important things in life, like get married or have children or buy a house or really commit to a career or like, like the things that you will look back and will provide your life with direction and very likely meaning for those familial and interpersonal ones to have adventures. But your inside's always gonna be, there's always gonna be fear involved. And cognitive behavioral therapy is the opposite of that. It's about getting the hot, getting around your feelings rather than becoming engulfed and consumed by them. Okay. That's, that's as, that's as short as I can make it. So sure. that's, so that's why I would say that's not good information. And also in terms of like the ideological and the very simplistic explanation that uh, students and young people are being given for things that make the world actually seem much more scary mm -hmm. than it is. Um, much scarier than it is. And with simpler solutions that apparently everyone's conspiring not to implement. Yeah. And, and with simpler yeah. solutions, what if they, uh, to attempt to act out will make the world more dangerous for everyone. Yep. Um, with a sort of listen and believe more ideological, almost religious approach, which is kind of anti-critical thinking where the answer is just provided mm -hmm. and it's your job to cram it into your view of reality as best you can mm -hmm. with minimizing dissonance, which becomes challenging after you live a little bit while and uh, get to know people in situations and see how people really are rather than how they're presented to be in whatever stru ide ideological structure you've been drawn into. Okay, so would you say that if I wanted to, 
create a catastrophic environment. <laughs> We've done a good job. For the if, Western if world, I would take everyone who's perpetually uncertain about the world and has fears that may or may not be founded. Mm -hmm. I would encourage them to abstain from critical thinking and then provide them with an ideological approach that provides them with the answer to everything. They just simply have to embed it in everything and force it to occur. Yeah. Would, that be a, would that be a good way to ruin the world? Well, in addition to that, I would interact with everyone that I possibly could online. So I'd never have to go out in the world and meet people who are even remotely different than I, than I am mm -hmm. in any way to find out that people who are different than you are very often not scary and you have something to learn from each other. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and this is Sesame Street level bullshit yeah. that we all learned in the 80s. Yeah, and somehow and things have become undone and regressed to the point where I have to explain some Ernie and Bert level shit <laughs> that you learn by watching those two guys who can never get along somehow live together. And that, that's what their lesson is. Yeah. It's like two people who are totally different, learning to let, live together and work through their differences. Mm -hmm. And we have regressed beyond the point of Ernie and Bert level approach to dealing with the world. I just thought of that while you were talking. I was like, where have I, where have I, this is like Mr. Rogers. No, 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 more specifically, <laughs> Sesame Street. No, no, more specifically, who are the characters? It's Ernie and Bert. Mm -hmm. And I'm clearly Ernie. Uh, so no, you no, excuse me, you're Ernie and I'm Bert. Because he's taller. taller. Yep. I'm taller and more uptight and like fun less and complain yes. more. So you, you heard it here, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. we, we all could learn from Bert and Ernie. Uh, I mean, when, and when, also, when, and also, the current landscape that we find ourselves in, and currently what's being delivered to young burgeoning minds, seems almost completely deliberately formulated to ruin everything. Well, and it's funny the the wisdom we forget because when I would do neuropsychological evaluations on children and young adults to kind of put the family at ease, very often I would say, as we all learned in Mister Rogers, I can't say this anymore because this is no longer common knowledge. Like some people are good at some things and some people are good at some other things and everybody's better at some things than they are at other things, but everybody's good at some things mm -hmm. just to, so just to like kind of humanize. And I don't know how effective I was. I mean, I'm no longer in that career, so I couldn't have been that great, mm -hmm. but um, I was more about dealing with school systems than mm -hmm. anything I was doing or not doing, but just to kind of normalize what was going on in, in a human context. And we've kind of lost so many shared human contexts through engaging everything in a digital medium. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. When, when the, uh, when the obvious humanity, right. That lies behind human eyes is no longer present in front of you. And they've been reduced to some picture and words on a screen. It becomes very easy to dismiss or demonize or, uh, attack uh, them. Uh, yeah, it's it's not good of, for the human psyche. They're just part of Trump's America, and they deserve to burn. I like your voice. If, that was good. And if you say that to me, I'm going to laugh in your face because <laughs> I have evidence of me doing that, that sort of thing now. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's all right. Um, so I wanted to share. There's 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 two. I'm sorry. I, I'm still listening. I just need to. My wife is not respecting my pronouns and my recording time. So uh, Derek's hearing gear some, but uh, there were two things um, that I want to make sure that I touched on uh, before um, we we end the episode. And one of them. Sorry, I, I actually, I lost you for a few seconds there due to my okay. tech incompetence. You're, you're back now though? Yes, I'm back. I okay. unplugged my microphone slightly. Or okay. my it's not even my, anyway. So Derek's back. And <laughs> there were two things that I wanted to make sure that we touched on in this conversation. Um, one of them, it was, I wanted to share with you uh, the answers that um, my colleagues gave and I want you to. You said you weren't going to mention those, though. No, I wasn't going to mention them at the time. Right? Oh, you're going to dox the hell out of them now. No, I'm only going to dox one of them, who I've doxed before. Who? Dan, my colleague. Oh, your who boy. I, yeah, your boy Dan. Your, your boy, boy Dan. Dan. Uh, and the other one who uh, I will tell you 
uh, what their name is, um, what his name is uh, when we get there. Um, so I asked them both because I torment my colleagues with, you know, questions like this all the time. And mm -hmm. they are very generous in um, actually. Because they're answer. afraid of you. Uh, maybe. I don't know. You should be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm the funny one. Just. Oh, no, I was trying to be uh, oh. actually frightening, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so, and uh, the, uh, one of my buddies, he said, uh, this was his answer. This is, this is what your boy Dan said. Mm -hmm. um, he said, well, he cares a great deal about fairness, right? And being, uh, be making sure that what he's doing is either right or wrong, especially from a fair point of view. Right. Mm -hmm. And he has a sense of justice, obviously, which is un not, un not unsurprising uh, or rather not, not surprising. And mm -hmm. he said that he thinks critical thinking is important, especially for him. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm paraphrasing here because it assists him with implementing his priorities like fairness and morality, because our intuitive and immediate reasoning in decision making uh, will not often produce fair or moral outcomes. Well, you guys, so, you guys are all cops of various stripes too. So, uh, so sort sort of right. I guess you could say that. But but either way, right? Well, the, law, law law enforcement. So reliable. Reliable. Well, well, well whatever. They, yeah, but that's yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's irrelevant in this case, right? So, the uh, well, let me tell you what I'm getting at. So, sure. he says thinking through planning uh, and decision makings will increase the likelihood that he will not cause undue harm or disparity. Yeah. Right. So what I want to point out here, right, is that here is an individual that thinks that if nothing else, the importance of critical thinking is it permits you to make sure that if you have a prioritization of how you want to live your life, what sorts of outcomes you want to produce, things you want to make sure you want to avoid, critical thinking helps you achieve those things. Right. Because it makes sure, or at least to the extent that you can, it helps you um make less bad decisions that are going to produce outcomes you really didn't want to have happen because yeah. you were relying too much on the immediacy or the irrationality of your uh, decisions that were reached in very short order. Yeah. So um, short-term gain for long-term fuck up. Yeah. And so I thought that was actually a really interesting way of looking at it, right? Where critical thinking just helps you reach the priorities you have. Um, you know, even if it were perfectly selfish, right? Even if you, you just really wanted to uh, make sure that everything you did was consistent with what your outlook on life, you want to ultimately um, reach those goals. And you're going to want to do that more effectively by using critical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to get you what you want. And so that's what, that's what your boy Dan said, which I liked. Yeah. And the other answer that I got from my other colleague, who I will not share his, his name, um, he has requested uh, that I use a stage name or a pen name for him because he's already made the insinuation that he's going to steal my book prior to it being released and replace my name with his name and go to Kinko's and uh, copy a bunch and get and, and strip it out. Okay. Um, so his name um, is Sammy September uh, because it's alliterative like Matthew March and it's also got a month in the name. Uh, so his yeah you, <laughs> wait your name your name's Matthew Marsh so no. your name like you were named no like the March March, March yeah March so yeah. it's like your name by Stan Lee because he named everybody alliteratively oh okay there we go Peter so he Parker, and I he yeah. and I he and I are both superheroes that's what no. you're saying right no oh no okay. it's just I I never thought of it that way that mm. but it just sort of clicked in now that you're giving him. Semi September, which I don't know, it sounds like a men's calendar or something. Yeah, it sounds pretty sexy, actually. Sexy <sighs> Semi September. <laughs> All right. So, Slow blink. he said that um, humans, because they are very um, habitual animals, right? We're very mm -hmm. pattern animals. We like to replicate things that we're familiar with. And you can see that in everything that we do, right? We are creatures of habit. That if we abstain from engaging in critical thinking, then we are far more likely to consistently continue um, regular habituated behavior 
Mm -hmm. And even though things like progress or improvements could occur, they would be rare. Yeah, you just get stuck in your groove. Yeah, we would be fortunate when they occur and uh, it would be circumstantial. And so what- Neurologically, this bears out on human behavior where you being stuck in a rut or a habitual pattern is a very common thing to happen to people. And it's absolutely harder than a lot of people think. Anybody that's tried to break his habit, even a non-substance related one will tell you that. Yeah. Um, and so he, he said that critical thinking is important and valuable, not only for individuals, but for society at large, because it encourages us to actively engage in a way of living or perceiving that would at least offer the opportunity to increase the frequency of improving upon, succeeding over, or accomplishing over or beyond, or progressing past things that may not have necessarily been bad, but either inefficient or not as good as something else or more cost, uh, we can move on to things that are more cost effective. And so critical thinking is a way of expeditiously existing um, in the limited period of time that we have. Are those his words or yours? Uh, that's my reframing. Uh, well summarized. Yeah. Uh, but, but no, he, uh, and I thought those were both very interesting uh, takes and they're not ones that I would have have uh, probably come up with in quite that way, uh, mm-hmm. which is again, a testament to the fact that people, people know shit and you know, they sometimes have thought about this kind of thing and sometimes they haven't, but if you ask someone a question like that, that they are probably not used to answering, even if they kind of struggle or flail about trying to answer it, they can give you some very interesting insights that you never would have thought of on your own. Um, talking to other people is very important. It um, is, which is important. why you shouldn't stay in an online echo chamber. Uh, yeah. There, there are real people out there. Um, so I hope everyone's doing well and uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Take care of yourselves and one another. Goodbye.